welcome back tyrants today we have another one piece video for you and this time it's a chapter in review with these videos are going to be our look backs at some of the previous chapters so not the um, upcoming or most recent chapter but chapters that have already passed and we've already discussed a little bit and what i plan to do is just talk about how impactful of a chapter it was how grave a chapter it was um, these are less going to be my favorite chapters and more big chapters that had a changing effect on the world of one piece and so naturally i thought it would be wise to do the in my opinion greatest chapter of one piece to date 957 ultimate now in case you haven't read ultimate before watching this video please stop and please go read it this is literally one of the chapters of one piece that you you must read and have that reaction to yourself it's such a great chapter. When I first read it, I was so hyped. The hype was just unreal. Um, I read it at least 10 times in that moment. I literally just read front to back, went back, front to back, went back, front to back. It was so good, so good. And then after I read it, I just couldn't wait to, to see how everyone reacted to it. So I would read it like twice, three times, and then I would go online, and then I would you know, watch a couple of people react to it, read it myself again watch someone react to it i would read it as they're reacting to it just this chapter in itself was just a massive hype bump for one piece um, i know it was trending for a while everyone was talking about it and it's worthy of that this is a really great chapter so let's get into it a little bit let's break it down and see why this chapter is so amazing we start off with fujitora and sakazuki talking about the abolishment of the warlords and now Fujitora is pretty happy about this development. Um, he's been trying to get this for as long as we've known his character. Mainly because of the Dressrosa incident, um, the Alabasta incident. But he sees what hiring pirates to kind of work with the government does for the people of the world. You know, it's in some aspects a deterrent to other pirates but you're also giving very powerful and evil people free reign to do whatever they want so Fujitora he's he's not with it he's like we get the world out of here Sakazuki on the other hand isn't exactly sold on that idea which I found very interesting because he hates pirates he he hates a lot of things so for him to be, be somewhat hesitant to get rid of them is interesting and it, it plays into the next part in which Fujitora tells him that, you know, it's fine. We have the SSG. That's going to take care of it. And Sakazuki's more along the lines of, will it? Or will it go against us? Um, how are these scales going to balance? So he's not even really sure if this was a good idea. And his apprehension is interesting because he's such a moving forward character. He seems like the character that'd be like, yep, we got rid of the pirates. I've been waiting to do that for a while now. But he seems like, even though I hate them, they were serving some kind of purpose. And now that they aren't there, I think that introduces a new issue. And I think it even makes it worse that they're dealing with um, Big Mom and Kaido meeting up, the reverie and whatever happened with Sabo and Alabast Kingdom. So they have a lot of things they're trying to handle at once, and for that to happen, Sakazuki's just like, we've got too much going on. This this might not turn out well. And when talking about those things, Sakazuki mentions the return of the rocks, Big Mom and Kaido teaming up, and how terrible that's gonna be. And you have Fuji's reaction where he's like, Are you serious? Like, I thought that was just a myth. Um, I didn't think that would ever happen again. And Sakazuki's like, this is very real, and this is very much a problem. And at this point, we don't know too much about the rocks. We've been speculating for a while, or we were speculating for a while, that the rocks was this team of pirates. I think originally it started as one person, but uh, this team of pirates. And so now they're being mentioned again. We're like, okay, so are we getting a little bit more this time? And it turns out that we do. We, we move on to the Marines having a meeting about the changes in the world as they normally do you know the abolishment of the warlords what's happening with big mom and kaido just the overall state of the world and what's up ahead and then you have sengoku who happens to be in this meeting kind of looking over the the younger generation and he starts telling them about the rocks and 
we get one of the most information heavy lore heavy dumps in one piece that I can think of. You know, we get a basically full explanation on what the rocks is as a pirate crew. You have their captain, Rox Dizabek, uh, a will of D carrier, and a man who wanted to be king of the world. You know, not just pirate king, not just an emperor, you wanted to be king of the world. Um, on that emu level of ambition and goal. And that's one of the things that kept him from being recorded in history is that he had a lot of goals that didn't line in with how the world operates. You know, he wanted to be king of the world. I'm assuming he had some kind of interest in the void century. I'm assuming he had interest in poneglyphs and ancient weapons, things that would make him king of the world. And so they hit all that. And not only do you have this legendary man, you have the people who served under him. People like Big Mom, Whitebeard, Kaido, Shiki, Captain John. All these big names in the One Piece world are all on one crew at once. And you get yourself thinking that, well, of course, this is the strongest pirate crew to exist. You know, you have what I don't want to say prime Big Mom. You have Big Mom, Kaido, and maybe maybe prime Whitebeard, close to prime Whitebeard. Either way, it's Whitebeard. Um, you have three these three huge pirates, and then you have the others like Shiki. Shiki is huge in his own right. You have Captain John, who is famous in his own right. We don't really know how strong or how formidable Captain John was, but to be name dropped in the same lines as Shiki, I, I think that gives him some credibility. And we get a few other parts, um, some we haven't heard of, like Silver Axe. We're not too familiar with. I imagine we'll get more info on those later. But what this does is it opens a channel for us to speculate who else was on this crew. Because we have, I'll say for now, two other members that weren't confirmed, but everyone's pretty much like, yeah, they were here. And that's Shaki from Sabondi, and that's Bakken, Weevil's mom in, you know, the, the quotations Edward Newgate's wife or lover or however you want to put it because we, we know Shaki was on a crew 40 years ago and that she was chased by Garp so it it really does point to her being on the rocks and then we know Bakken was on a crew with Whitebeard and it's it's unclear how many crews Whitebeard was on before he had his own I know that there's there's the crew in his flashback during his death which I don't think is the rocks. I think that was before the rocks. And then you have Whitebeard on the rocks where he's more of an established name. And I think he has that established strength as well. So I would give him at least two crews and I would probably say that it was the rocks considering how young he was on the other crew or how, how, how young he looked on the other crew. So with all these legendary people under their banner, of course, they had a lot of legendary feats, but again, those things were hidden just because of how connected Rox was to the taboo subjects of the world that, and they didn't really like talking about it. They kind of hated each other. It, it wasn't a comrades kind of crew. It was more of like a, I want something, you want something. We can both get it if we work together type crew. And that kind of falls apart depending on how much pressure you put on it. Which is evident by the destruction of the Rocks Pirate crew by Garp and Roger. Um, there's the God Valley incident in which Garp and Roger fight the Rocks and the Rocks lose. The details of how the Rocks lose are somewhat unclear. We know that Garp was there. We see in the panel that Garp took some kind of beating and probably dished out one as well. Um, and that's about it. We don't see what Roger looked like. We don't see what the other crew members of the Rocks looks like. We really just see what Garp went through. And this is what gives Garp his Hero of the Marines title. Because he, as far as the world knows, he took down Rocks by himself. Um, it's not reported that Roger was with him. So he has this feat of taking out the Rocks by himself, which, which realistically I don't think is possible because you have one, you have Whitebeard. Whitebeard is the major outlier in the, the battle aspect of this. Because Whitebeard, I think at this point, 
is either the world's strongest man or close to being the world's strongest man. And I don't see Garp being able to beat Whitebeard while having to deal with Big Mom, Kaido, Shiki, Rox, all these other people. So what you have is Roger taking care of some of these people. I don't know if Roger can handle Whitebeard, Big Mom, Kaido, Shiki, Rox, and all these others. So that begins to question who else was there? Because we have Garp, we have Roger. You know, was was Rayleigh there? Were any of the strong Marines with Garp there? Like, did he really do all this on his own, as far as the Marines go? And I wager to say yes, just because no one else talks about it. I mean, Sengoku only has what appears to be second-hand knowledge of how this event took place. So, if there were Marines that went there, they are far and few between that have the story and are willing to share it. Now, the fight on God Island was supposedly over protecting the Celestial Dragons and their slaves. And with that, that brings up a lot more questions. Because we know Garp. We know Garp hates the Celestial Dragons. We know he doesn't care for their methods or them as people. He thinks they're scumbags. So why would he protect them? Even if it's in his job title, why would he protect them? And you ask the same question for Roger. Why would Roger fight to protect Celestial Dragons? My opinion is that they were both doing it for the slaves. Um, because most likely Celestial Dragons were holed away somewhere and the slaves were essentially out and being used as a shield. Pretty much like if these pirates are going to destroy this island, take them first while we try and escape. So it makes sense that Garp would try and protect them. Why Roger was here doing what he did, it, it's still somewhat unclear. The, the connection Roger has to all of this really only lies with Garp for now, because we know that they have a kind of friendly rivalry. So the only reason I can see Roger really helping is because Garp's his friend. But that seems like not enough of a reason for Roger to be here on Guide Island in the first place and to fight the Rocks Pirates. Myself, I wonder if they had more help than just Garp and Roger. Like, I wonder if, for example, Whitebeard. This... The whole Rock's crew doesn't seem like something that Whitebeard would be into. Um, just the way his character has been portrayed, he's about family, you know, he's about respect. And for them to be essentially killing each other, trying to cover up exploits, not really working together as a family, but working together for a goal of riches and fame, that's not what Whitebeard's about. So when confronted with, you know, Garp and Roger, how, how did he react to that? How did he react to having to fight these two? Because if Rox wins, it seems like the Celestial Dragons and the Slaves aren't being protected anymore, which means they could get hurt. And while Whitebeard wouldn't care about the Celestial Dragons, I'd imagine he doesn't want to hurt the Slaves. I'd imagine that'd be against what Whitebeard feels as a person. So him fighting this... He, he wouldn't naturally be on Rox's side because if Rox wins, these people could get hurt. Um, so did he help Garp and Roger? Did he not fight as much as he could? What 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 was Whitebeard's role in all of this? It really seems like he, he would be a pivotal character in this fight because if he's set to one side, I don't see that one side losing. Um, so with him being set to Rox's side and with all of these people being on Rox's side, it doesn't make sense for them to lose. Um, even with how strong Garp and Roger are, it doesn't make sense for them to go down. Rox was stated to be Roger's biggest rival, so each, each one of these big names, you would need an equally strong person to kind of keep at bay. You know, you're going to need someone strong to fight Rox, so you have Roger. You're going to need someone strong to fight Whitebeard, you have Garp. But then that leaves Big Mom and Kaido and everyone. And 
maybe you have Rayleigh in there, maybe you have, you know, someone else of their caliber, but you don't have enough people to kind of handle that firepower. So in my opinion, someone, maybe more than just Whitebeard, but someone didn't keep fighting on Rox's side, and that's why they lost. But yeah, Sengoku goes through all of this, and you have their reactions of the Marines just flabbergasted at this huge chunk of history that no one really knows. And this is a pivotal point for a lot of different reasons, and it's not well known. Just because, you know, part of it, the government hides it, the other part, people don't talk about it. And so you have Sengoku kind of giving them this information just so that they know, because it's possible there could be a resurgence. And with that, we lead into the bounties. That's right, we finally get the bounties of the Yonko. Now, this is something that I think early on, a lot of people were like, I wonder what their bounties are like. But as the story progressed, I feel like we kind of got into the motion of, we wouldn't hear what they were. Or it, it wasn't a big thing because these people can't be captured. You know, it doesn't matter what Whitebeard's bounty is because no one is capturing Whitebeard. So we kind of didn't expect it. And for it to come after that information dump previously, it's, it's just a huge shock. One of the reasons why his chapter is amazing. And we start off with Blackbeard. He has the lowest bounty. And his we already knew from, I think, chapter 925 when they kind of do his timescape reintroduction. Uh, and they they talk about how he's becoming a threat like Wiper was. You know, he's getting land. He's amassing power. And I think for, for all these bounties, I think that they sit where the character sits. So I think that these bounties not necessarily show the character's power, but show where they are in lines with each other. So I'll say, yeah. Blackbeard has the lowest bounty, and I think he's, at this point in time, the, the weakest Yonko. You know, I think he's still got learning to do with his powers. I think he's still trying to amass a proper crew. And I think he can get to be the strongest. I just don't think he's there yet. And of course, he's the newest. So he's working on all this. He still doesn't know how it works better than the other three do. They've been doing this for a while now. You know, they have the, the inside scoop on how this works. And the next is Shanks. And I don't know if this surprised a lot of people. Personally, I wasn't surprised because this is where I put Shanks as far as the Yonko tier. Um, I put him as third strongest. And so he falls into the third highest bounty. What we take into account here is that he's only been a Yonko for about six years. I think at some point we were informed that he was a Yonko when he met Luffy? Not the case. Only been Yonko for about six years, so that means he became a Yonko while missing an arm. And I know that the missing arm thing has been stated before to have not had an effect on his strength. And I think that's a big thing to note just because it's not a matter of an effect, it's a matter of perception. You know, you have a one-armed man becoming Yonko. So how much of his strength was unaffected and how much strength does he have to be able to do that with just one arm? You know, it it hypes Shanks up a little bit. Another thing to note about Shanks is that Renu describes his crew in interesting detail. You know, he says they're well balanced, they're impregnable. And he even goes through to mention the names of Beckman, Lucky Roo, Yasup. And so I think what this does is tell us that Shanks's crew in a whole is is a strong core. So you don't have a lot of people, but you have a lot of strong people. So as far as you know, Big Mom has what her 85 or so kids. While well, Shanks maybe has like 30 crew members in general. I'd wager to say that Shanks's crew overall is stronger than hers. You know, it's it's a matter of a, a numbers game versus a strength game, quantity versus quality. And I think Shanks has the quality to match a lot of quantity. And then we move up to Big Mom, and she is the second highest. We don't learn a lot of new info about Big Mom. They just mention that, you know, she wiped out the city of giants. She only trusts her family. She founded her own kingdom, which she rules over. 
and that she's a, a natural born monster. And this, again, is where I sit Big Mom on the list, second strongest. Something I find interesting about Big Mom is that they mention that she founded her country. And so what makes me think is, what can the world government do about that? Because if they were to try and take that country, you know, what does that look like as far as the world government? Because the people of Tataland don't hate living there. You know, we've seen that they have a pretty peaceful lifestyle. All they have to do is give some of their lifespan and they're good to go. Um, at most, they worry when Big Mom goes on her hunker rampages, but other than that, they seemed to enjoy living there. So if the world government wants to say like, hey, you're a pirate, you can't have this country. How does that work? Um, I'd be curious to see what, not only, you know, as far as a fight goes, but what political things that would entail as far as the world government just occupying someone's country. And last but not least, for the current Yonko, we have Kaido. He sits at the highest, and I think he's the strongest of the current Yonko. Uh, they mentioned that he was an apprentice on the Rock's crew, which makes sense because he seems to be in the younger generation with Shanks rather than... Um, where Big Mom and Whitebeard were. But the idea of Kaido is that he he got to where he was on strength. You know, he wasn't one to occupy land. He wasn't one to, to hunt out resources. He just pure strength. Gathered people to his banner, gathered names here and there, and just said, you know, I'm we're heading out, I'm taking over. And he did it. And the apprentice part makes it interesting for the fight because in this we, we hear that Big Mom and Kaido are stronger now than they were before. So what level were they when they fought against Garp and Roger? You know, clearly from what's being stated, they weren't as strong as they are now. So were they at a level in which they weren't as big a threat? Because we know Big Mom was a threat at five. She was taking out giants at five. So even if she wasn't as strong as she is now, I imagine she was still a threat when Garp and Roger fought. And maybe Kaido was too. I mean, we know he's got this invulnerability type ordeal. Don't know how long that's been there. Don't know long he how long he's been a dragon. So there's a few mysteries that they really question, really make you question that fight and what could have happened. And for the last two bounties, we get Whitebeard and Roger. Um, both over 5 billion, Rogers being the highest of all time we've seen in the series, and then Whitebeard being the second highest. And I think this goes to show that these two characters were above even what a Yonko is. Because we know, obviously, Roger was the king of pirates. He was he was the goat, you know, he was the top dog. And Whitebeard essentially was the guy who was closest to becoming that after Roger. So we have these two whose bounties have never been matched, have never been surpassed, and I don't think they will be surpassed until Luffy reaches his final bounty. Another thing they bring up is that no pirate has surpassed these bounties. So no pirate has gotten higher than Whitebeard or Roger. And this brings into question, what about a non-pirate? You know, is Dragon the most wanted man in the world's bounty? If he has like a bounty in that, that sort of description, is that higher? Could it be higher? My opinion, it's not. I think that Whitebeard and Roger have the highest bounties and the only person that's gonna surpass them is Luffy. Um, Zoro's may get high enough to maybe match, but really I only see Luffy's becoming that high. Now we don't get the revised bounties of the Warlords quite yet. I imagine that's coming when we do another kind of either flashback or cutaway to the events of the Reverie. And then we'll get some updates on a lot of things, you know, what happened with the Warlords, what their bounties are, what happened at Reverie, how the world government's reacting to it, how Dragon's reacting to it. A lot of stuff comes in when that happens. So for now, this this is it. He, he gives us this and then kind of puts the caps on it like, we'll be back later, trust me. And near the end of the conversation, Sengoku is kind of talking about Wano and Sakazuki comes in and says, you know what, we're done here. Um, we're not messing with Wano. There's too much going on. We can't handle it. And Sengoku is like, I wasn't suggesting. I was more of informing. 
you know, these Marines need to know what's going on because one, no one else is going to tell them, and two, it could happen again. They need to be ready. And Skoku also makes a comment about how Wano seems to be like this hub for high pirate activity. Like the, the big times all have something to do with Wano, whether it be uh, Roger, Whitebeard, Odin, Kaido now, and then Luffy's here, a lot of the supernova are here. So it's like Wano seems to be this meeting ground for all these big names before something big happens. And so Sengoku's kind of like, we should be prepared for that. And I think that's a valid argument. A lot of stuff is going down in Wano that's going to change the One Piece world. And they have to be ready for it or else they're going to get swept up in the waves. One thing I thought about when Sengoku and Sakazuki were talking about Wano is that if there is something special about Wano, if it has connections that are deeper to the lore of One Piece, is that why Kaido took interest in it? Is that why Kaido went there and said, I want this land? Because we've been getting bits and pieces about Kaido's character and what his ultimate goals are, besides, you know, wanting to die or wanting to have a great war. And it seems that he has some interest in Odin's knowledge, what Odin knew not only about you know the the past but what he would have shared with the rest of the world and he's been trying to get that information which is why he asked for the retainers like did odin tell you anything about the journeys about the one piece you know anything like that but from what we know odin hasn't been talking for the most part he kept it in his journal which yamato has now it's questionable what content is in that journal I doubt it's going to be exactly what Kaido's looking for, but there's probably some info that we don't have that would be interesting to hear. And that wraps up the chapter. Um, I think one of the reasons this chapter was so big for us fans in a lot of ways is that it dropped so much lore and world building, and that's that's one of the things that makes One Piece so entertaining to read and watch. Um, having re haven't been reading it for a long time and watching it for a long time, to see this compilation of information kind of get thrown at you it's it's overwhelming it's amazing and it's overwhelming because this is all stuff that we've been speculating for a while this is things we've been wondering about for a while some things we haven't been wondering about but we got it and we're like yes this is amazing so to have it all condensed into one chapter it's it's such a huge jump in what we know as fans you know, we get so much information 